Matthew chapter 27, and it's on screen for all of us here. You don't need to grab your Bibles just yet. But it says this in verse 50. Then Jesus shouted again, and he released his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, the rocks split apart, and the tombs opened up. And the bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. How is that? Nothing could hold them down. Then they left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, and they went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. And they said, this man was truly the Son of God. I don't know what it's going to take to convince you if you're not already convinced. But there is more evidence of Jesus' resurrection. There's more evidence to him emptying the tomb. There's more evidence of him showing himself to countless hundreds, if not thousands of others after he raised from the dead, before he ascended to heaven. There is more evidence that tells us that Jesus was raised from the dead than any witness or testimony or account of those who heard about Abraham Lincoln's death. We have way more evidence. I don't know what it's going to take to convince us, but we are here tonight in Spire Y. Kelly. And if this is your first time to church, I pray by the end of our time together that you will be absolutely convinced that even on a silent Saturday that we're going to look at tonight, that God is still working. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll deposit the seed of your word into the depths of our heart. Help us to grasp this truth, but help us to see how you are moving in our lives even now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, can we thank Jesus one last time? Amen. Go ahead and grab your seats. Let's continue our service. And welcome to Easter weekend 2021. Can you believe it? Last year. Come on, just a year ago, we could not, we did not have any in-person Easter services. But I tell you, that didn't stop the church. Amen. Come on, the church still moves. The church is breathing. It's alive and well, everybody. And we are doing services right now. And we're going we're gonna to bring the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. Because ain't nothing going to stop God's church. So tonight, welcome to Holy Saturday. And what happened on this Saturday... 2,000 years ago, the disciples, they were running in fear. The Pharisees, they were probably rejoicing. They just killed the man who was doing all these miracles. And he was doing all these signs and wonders. And everybody had flocked. Everybody had followed Jesus. And they stopped believing in and trusting the Pharisees. So the Pharisees were rejoicing. The Pharisees were truly at Sabbath. They were resting. And they were resting because they were rest assured that there was no riot that was happening because the disciples, was no, they, were nowhere, they were nowhere to be found. The disciples were hiding in a room, locked doors, behind locked doors because of fear. Maybe because of shame. Maybe because they had begun to think, was Jesus who he said he was? Well, he's in, that, he's in that tomb right now. They couldn't see what was happening behind that rolled stone. They couldn't see what was going on behind in that dark cave, that hewn tomb that was brand new, given by Joseph of Arimathea. And I would love to continue our story here. In Matthew chapter 27, as evening approached, Joseph, a rich man of Arimathea who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release it to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. And then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and they were watching. And the next day on the Sabbath, this is now Saturday, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to see Pilate 
And they told him, sir, we remember that the deceiver, Jesus, once said while he was still alive, after three days, everybody say three days. After three days, I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body. And then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. So Pilate replied, take guards and secure it the best that you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. So Jesus breathes his last breath, verse 50, gives up his spirit, the temple veil torn in two, it was done, he was taken down from the cross, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, the same Nicodemus from John chapter 3, went to go see Jesus at night because he didn't want to be seen by anyone, that's why they call him Nick at night, and so he went to see Jesus, and he was the very one who was questioning this Jesus. But at the crucifixion, he was already convinced that, yes, indeed, there was something different about Jesus. So he partners with Joseph, pulls the bloody, mangled body of Jesus off of the cross, limp, cold, blood-stained. And they begin to clean his body, and they wrapped it carefully with honor, with dignity, as a custom of Jewish burial would apply and they begin to wrap his body and put it in the brand new tomb now these women another verse in Luke chapter uh, 22 I believe that they were not only looking but as soon as they saw that the tomb was being filled with Jesus's body and the stone was rolled they rushed home they rushed home because they had spices they had the frankincense, they had the myrrh, and they were preparing their, their mixture so that they could embalm the body of Jesus, so that they could spread that ointment over the, the linen cloth so that it would protect the smell and it would be able to honor and preserve the body during its process of decay. They had no idea what was happening on Sunday. And so they would show up Sunday morning early. I used to think they got up early because they were women. And, you know, most of the time, you know, the women are the, are the super spiritual ones, right? <laughs> they are. I know my wife is. But I used to think that they got up early because they were so enthralled that they wanted to go see Jesus. But they had no idea that the body would be missing. And they were going there to prepare the body for the, the final preparation of burial. But the stone was covering the entrance throughout that entire Saturday. And you've got to think for a second, these Pharisees, in everything that they were thinking and everything that they were rejoicing in, in all the relief that they felt because Jesus was finally dead, the disciples were on the run. No gospel account tells us in detail what happens on the Sabbath because it's the Sabbath. Nobody did anything. Everybody rested. Everybody relaxed. There was no work to be done. There was no cooking to be done. No shops were open. Everything halted and ceased. And I wonder if sometimes for us, I wonder, when God seems silent, when it seems like there's no activity, we might be wondering where is God now? Maybe you're here tonight. Maybe you haven't been to church in a while. Maybe this is your first time to inspire we, we absolutely thank you for coming. We, we, we're appreciative that you're spending your Saturday night here. Maybe you came because of a friend. Maybe you came because you saw an ad in the newspaper or, or you saw the TV, sh the t TV program. Or maybe, maybe you saw a street sign, a banner, and you ended up coming to our church. You know, so many people come to our Mililani location because of our street signs and our banners. Can I tell you, God has a reason why you're here. But just because it might feel like a waiting season, it doesn't have to be a wasted season. That in this Saturday, when everything seemed quiet, everything seemed silent, God was at work. Jesus was doing work behind the closed tomb. And so Saturday comes. The Sabbath is here. And I have to put myself in, myself in the disciples' shoes again. 
and I begin to think to myself, is this how it's supposed to end? Was this how Jesus was going to finish his time on earth? Wasn't he the one that just raised Lazarus a week and a half ago? Wasn't Jesus the one that healed the blind eyes and made the deaf and the mute hear and see and talk? Isn't this really the Messiah? Don't you think that maybe the disciples, they felt a little bit of shame and maybe they retreated out of not just fear but out of defeat. That they were waiting and expecting the Son of God, Jesus himself, to conquer not just Rome but even in this situation to conquer death. Even they too did not know what to do with themselves on Saturday. Sometimes when we're in these waiting periods, we don't know what to do. Now, I'm sure in this room, we've all been a part of uh, our own share of waiting room time. You know, I bet you if you had to calculate how much time you spent in a waiting room, it's probably about a month of your life. <laughs> Anybody, uh, what, do you do? what do you do in the waiting room? You check your phone, you answer texts, you jump on Instagram, you film your TikTok, whatever. <laughs> you play your Pokemon Go or whatever, whatever new game is out there now. You know, what do you do in the waiting room? You, you find ways to occupy your waiting time. But here in this situation, the disciples didn't know what to do. They weren't eating. They were worrying. They were stressing. They were contemplating. And still they didn't know what God was doing. But even when you don't see anything happening, Jesus is up to something. Jesus is working. Let's, let's, let's continue this passage. Let's look at what happens. Let's go back. Verse 52, the bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection and they went into the holy city of Jerusalem. This is what we see in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter we see that Jesus goes into the depths of Sheol, into Hades and he gets the keys to hell, death and the grave. And he speaks and he preaches to the captives there. It's in there. It's in there. 1 Peter chapter 3. And it's an incredible story that Jesus, even in the tomb, even in the, the grave, he is doing work. He is not just sleeping. He's not taking some time off. Jesus is getting busy because he's getting busy because he's ready. He's, he's about ready to, to raise up a brand new people called the church. Come on, the risen Savior is going to raise up his people who is going to do some damage to the kingdom of darkness. But in the waiting... God wants us to do a few things. I think God wants us to under, understand a few things about him while we're waiting. Number one, while we're in the waiting room, remember this, that God is never surprised. God's never surprised. He wasn't taken aback by the betrayal from Judas. He wasn't caught off guard when he was blindfolded and beaten and punched in the face and sucker punched like Pastor Mike shared on Friday night. Jesus wasn't taken by surprise when he was nailed to the cross. He knew that was coming. He said, nevertheless, not, not my will be done, yours be done. Remember the seven places that Jesus bled? If you didn't hear Good Friday's message, I encourage you all, go to the YouTube channel and go hear last night's message. It is incredible. Probably by far the greatest Good Friday message I've ever heard or ever preached in my life. But Pastor Mike unpacks it so well. Jesus bled in the garden when he prayed and he said, Lord, not my will, yours be done. He bled sweat. He sweat drops of blood. And then he was before the trial and the high council. He bled because he was blindfolded and he was punched and he was, uh, he was spit on and he was mocked there. And then Jesus bled when he was whipped with the cat of nine tails. Jesus bled when they put the crown of thorns on his head. Jesus bled when his... Wrists were spread apart. His arms were spread open and his wrists were nailed with nine-inch nails. His, his feet bled. His blood spilled when, his na when in, the nail went through his ankles. And then finally he bled and he bled it all when his side was pierced. You know what's interesting about that pierce on, on the side? I, I want to go here just real quick to recap last night. When the Roman guard pierced Jesus' side and the blood and the water flowed, it's as if the heart had no more blood to pump, so all it could do was pump some liquid because Jesus paid it all. Every last drop was gone. It was done. The blood was poured out on our behalf. 
That's why there was water and blood. There was no more blood to give. Jesus paid it all, and he was never surprised. He was never surprised. Number two, God is still moving. The second thing that we must remember and we must understand about this God is that God is still moving. Even when I don't see it, it's, he's working. Even when I can't feel it, he's working. He's up to something. Even when you make a mistake, guess what? God is working. Because Romans 8.28 tells me that God works all things for the good according to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Matthew 27, 51. The curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two. Top to bottom, the earth shook, the rocks split apart. The tombs opened up. God is working. Even in the darkness, he's working. Even when you can't see what's right in front of you, God is working. Isaiah 65, 24, I will answer them before they even call to me. How is that? If you never thought the power of prayer, this is how powerful prayer is. Even before you hit your knees, God already knows what you're going to say. That's why you, you should approach God. In the waiting, because God is still moving, you should ask God. Still ask. He doesn't mind. And let's not take the attitude or the approach that, okay, well, if God's doing it, then I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit on my hands. No, that's not the way we live. Because faith without works is dead. There's no faith there. But God is still moving. I will answer them before they even call on me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. You know, I had to pray super hard today because I was cutting my dog's hair. Anybody, anybody try to shave their own dogs? You got a picture of me shaving my dog or that, that picture of my dog. Yeah, there we go. So I got my dog Poho in the back. It's Poho, not Poho, okay. For those of you that know Hawaiian, Poho is waste time. Poho is spot. But sometimes I should call her Poho. <laughs> Waste time. But you see my yard? <laughs> I ripped up my yard today because I was clipping her hair. I was trimming her hair with my, my buzzer. I have two buzzers. I took my old buzzer. And I, I thought, okay, I'm going to try trim my dog's hair. And uh, so I tried to. Man, it wasn't working. So it was hard. And, and the hair is so thin. And it was getting caught. And it was getting stuck in the buzzer. So I took the buzzer apart. And I dropped the screw. In the pile of rocks. <laughs> and I found one. But I couldn't find the other. And some of you are thinking, well, Pastor Clint, why, why did you take the screw off over the rocks? Of course. Of course. But I didn't know I was going to drop it. I just, I need to I need to fix this thing so I could finish cutting my dog's hair. So I, I dropped the screw. Literally an hour, I am on my knees, spreading the rocks, trying to find it. I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm struggling to find that screw. Do you guys see it? Can anybody spot the screw? Come on. If you spot the screw, I'll buy you dinner. <laughs> you see the screw? You see it? Anybody see it? Come on. Can you zoom in? Come on. Zoom in. I'm going to show you this. You see the screw right there? Okay. Zoom back out. Zoom back out. Zoom back out. I'm going to show you exactly where it is. Okay. I was digging all in this area. Guess where I dropped the screw? Right here. <laughs> the place I never touch. And that screw was lost. I was ready to give up. I was ready to throw in the towel. I was ready to say, forget it, Poho. Your hair is just going to grow long. You're going to have one half of your body shaved and the other half is not shaved. <laughs> it's still like that right now because I didn't have time to finish it. So I got to finish it on Monday. But I was praying so hard, Lord, help me to find this screw. An hour later, it's in the palm of my hand. An hour later. And... The Lord spoke to me because some of us have been stuck in this waiting season. We've been lost. You've been wondering, where is God? You've been wondering. You probably haven't even given a thought. But maybe you've been struggling in your own mind. You haven't given a thought to what God was up to. But God was on his hands and knees. 
and he was sifting through the rocks. He was looking for that lost coin. He was looking for that lost sheep. He was looking for that lost soul. And then he finds it, he sees it, and he puts it back together. Come on. Some of you in the waiting period, God is looking for you. He's right around the corner. He's going to rescue you. He's going to pull you up. He's going to encourage you. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. On this Saturday... The disciples are in anguish, they're in angst, they're in turmoil, they're crying out, they have no idea what to think. Their emotions are running wild. They didn't know Sunday was coming. Don't give up on the Saturday. Point number three, let's remember this, that God is not, he's never surprised God is still moving, and God has a plan. He has a plan. Sometimes we don't get to see or understand the plan in its fullness from A to B or A to Z. Sometimes he takes us to A to D, then back to B, then up to G, (laughs) then down to Y, (laughs) and then down to Y again, and then down to Y some more. Why, 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 God? (laughs) That's our waiting season. Why? Why? But can I encourage all of us, all, I'm speaking to, I'm preaching to myself tonight too, that we need to rejoice in these times because God has a plan. You know, a great friend of, our, of ours here at Inspire, in fact, he's not just a friend, he's a son of the house. And uh, David Sampiano and Robin Sampiano, we love their story. And God has healed him of cancer. God has rescued him. He's redeemed him. But now he's going through another bout, another battle, another season where he's battling cancer again. And I would love to share his story with us to encourage us tonight. So go ahead and roll that clip. I don't think there was ever a day where we never felt God's presence. There are days where we feel like, wow, like, why is this happening? Why does it keep happening? Like, you overcome a mountain and then next thing you know there's another mountain and going through cancer the first time and being cancer free and only to find out a few years later that it transferred to my liver from my kidney in moments where you feel like you just want to throw in the towel that's when his evidence even is more revealed to me i feel like it has to get to a place where you almost like hey lord you know i, I can't do this anymore you know, and he knows, and that's when he'll come and he'll show up. And sometimes it's through, like, our friends that inspire. And sometimes it's it's through my wife. In fact, most of the time it's through. God uses her to speak to me. Um, she doesn't speak much, but when she does, it's 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 deep. So like we're always fighting together. Um, not with each other. Not with each other. <laughs> For me, sometimes like when he's. Sleeping, I'll just like lay my hands on him and just ask for healing on his body. I find myself talking to the Lord about thanking him for the life that we have together. And but I believe I have such amazing reasons to fight. Like I look at my daughter, I look at my wife, you know, and they need me. So I don't have a moment to be weak. I don't have a moment to give up. I don't have moments where I never entertain the doubts. I never entertain the fear because God doesn't want me to go there. You know, it's like, it's so easy to go there, but you gotta make that choice every day. Like, hey, you know what, Lord, I'm gonna keep my hands up. I'm gonna keep my guard. I'm gonna read your word. I'm gonna plug in with the friends that I know will believe in me, will fight with me. You got to know who's in your corner. You have to have the right people, of course, God. That's the only way you're going to win a fight. Come on, that was so good. What an encouragement. He's still in the middle of his battle. He's still in his waiting period. But he's not wasting this waiting season. And I love that about our friend David. Well, let me leave us with three things. And here in Jeremiah 29, 11, this is the promise. This is God's promise to us. Because this promise came to Israel not after 
their deportation, not after the hard times came. This promise came at the very beginning of the, them being put into exile in Babylon. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Some of you tonight, you're here to hear this verse spoken over your life. Is that now is the time to seek the Lord with all your heart. Maybe you haven't been to church in a while. Well, don't let this stop you. Come back next week. In fact, come back tomorrow. It's a different message. We're not preaching the same thing tonight and tomorrow. In fact, Pastor Mike is going to be preaching all four tomorrow. It's going to be incredible here at Inspire White Kelly. It's going to be truly a celebration. But I want to leave us with three things. And write this down because I believe this will help you when you're waiting during these times. When it seems like God is silent or he's absent, he's there. He's right there with you. One, wait patiently. Stay alert for his return. Be prepared for the unexpected. Keep watch, Matthew 25, 113. Keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour of Christ's return. Number two, wait purposefully. Faithfully carry out whatever assignment that God has given you. Advance his kingdom and multiply disciples, Matthew 25. And wait proactively. How do we wait proactively? Like David said, have your hands up. Not just in a fighting posture, but in a worshiping posture. Come on, some of us in this waiting season, this is the best thing that you could do is surrender it all to God. Come on, would you stand to your feet on this holy Saturday? I want to pray for us. And if you're here in this place tonight, I want to pray specifically because some of you might be battling some internal some terminal disease, some diagnosis or prognosis that the doctor or your medical tech has spoken over your life. Well, we, we want to pray for you. And just as we're praying for David's healing, just as we're praying for so many other people who are battling cancer, we have a cancer care ministry now. We're praying for them. And maybe we need to pray for you tonight. So would everybody, would you bow your heads and close your eyes right now? I want to pray for those in this room. You're in a waiting season. You're waiting for the promise of God, God's healing to come upon your life. Well, I'm going to declare that God would release his healing over your body even now. If that's you, if you need healing in your body tonight, and you're praying, you're asking the Lord for that healing in your body. Would you lift your hand above your head so I can lift you up? Jesus, you see every hand. Come on, lift it high. No shame. God sees you. He already knew even before I was going to ask the question. Lord, I declare and I ask by the power of your Holy Spirit, come upon these people like never before. Release faith. Release healing. Because of your blood that was shed on that, that cross, because of your stripes, we are healed. Thank you, Jesus, that there is power in the blood of Jesus that we come before you. We declare that you are our healer. In Jesus' name, amen. Put your hands down. Keep your eyes closed. I want to address the second group of people tonight. And this is really not a healing of the body, but this is a healing of your soul. You don't have a, per a per personal relationship with Jesus. Maybe you think going to church is enough. Maybe you think praying once in a while is enough. No, Jesus is inviting you into the greatest friendship and relationship that you will ever know. And it's a relationship that you can walk with him daily. You can hear his whispers. You can hear him call you. You can hear him speak to you. You can read the promises of God and it's going to impact your soul and your spirit like never before. But that starts when you invite Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of your life. And if you've never given your life to him, why wait? Come on, there's enough evidence like I was saying that God raised him from the dead. We're not just wasting our time on a Saturday night. No, we're lifting our hands in praise and worship because of all that he's done but I want to invite you I want to invite you to experience what we've experienced I want you I want you to experience what we know to be true and so if you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life what it simply means is this he bled on that cross for your sins he forgave you and he paid the price for you so that you wouldn't have to pay that price yourself 
And in exchange, he gives you eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If that's you tonight, if you want to receive the assurance of salvation and you want to call Jesus your Lord and your Savior tonight, then surrender to him. At the count of three, lift your hand toward the heavens. Lift it above your head so I can see. And I want to count you because heaven is counting right now. And if your name is not secured in the book of life, then put your name by saying yes to Jesus. At the count of three, lift that hand so I can pray with you and lead you in that prayer. One, he'll never let you down. Two, God loves you and he's for you. So who can be against you? One, two, three. Lift it above your head if you want to pray that prayer and invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Come on, I already see one. I see two. Anybody else tonight? Is that three? I think I see three. Come on, anybody else? Lift it above your head so I can see four. Anybody else? Come on, I saw four hands go up. I saw four hands. I'm just going to give it a few more seconds. It doesn't matter how old or young. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you were to die tonight, would you know that your eternal salvation is secure? If not, why wait? Don't wait in the valley of indecision. Make a decision for Jesus tonight. I got four. I got five. I see you, sir. I see you. Amen. Come on. Can we thank the Lord for that? Come on. I, see, I saw one up in the rafters as well. I saw six. So everybody here at Inspire White Kelly, repeat after me. Follow my words. We're going to pray this out loud together. And we're going to believe with those six that tonight is going to mark a brand new start to their journey in life with Christ. So let's pray this. Follow my words. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for my sin and shame. Forgive me. Wash me clean. Make me whole. And make me brand new. Tonight, I declare that you are my God and I am your child. The old has passed away and the new has begun. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. So help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, can we celebrate? So good. Congratulations.